welcome to the Savvy Safety Sister Partners in Prevention podcast. I'm Carrie Pascarello. And this is Ingrid Centurion. Welcome to the Savvy Safety Sisters Partner in Prevention podcast. We're your host, Ingrid and Carrie, and it is National Preparedness Month. And we know one of the best ways to make a difference in preventing victimization and keeping you and your family safe is to inform the public about strategies, tools, and techniques to increase safety. And we want to empower our listeners with education and advocacy by experts. So what we're going to be sharing today is how we all can stay healthier after a natural disaster and how we can make a difference in our environment and make this world a better place. Now, this is a really timely issue because we've just experienced devastation from Hurricane Laura and its destructive effects on the environment. And so as a safety advocate, we wanna support natural disaster victims so they have tools that they can take control of a devastating situation and make it better and safer for the ones that they love. So now having said that, After Hurricane Laura, I kept thinking of a statement that I read from an environmental expert. And it went something like, please don't consume the water from private wells if the area has been flooded. And it went on stating the importance of having the water tested and tips about once the water's back online to flush your water lines at each of your taps prior to use. Now this is critical information that we need our listeners to hear that after a disaster hits like a hurricane, the importance of understanding the facts around water safety consumption is critical. Right, Ingrid? That's right, that's right. And and we're so grateful to have Tina Peters with us. She is a passionate, hardworking business owner and president of Mallard Incorporated, who has expert knowledge and focuses on environmental due diligence, environmental risk, and so much more. And she has worked for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection since its inception with the municipalities, the state agencies, and private property owners. She has over 30 years of experience in environmental and groundwater industry. She is a licensed Florida well driller, a state of Mississippi licensed driller, a certified environmental inspector and a certified environmental manager, a certified environmental specialist and a certified environmental consultant. She has a lot of certifications. And the last one (laughs) is a certified remediation specialist. So she knows what she's talking about. 30 years is a lifetime. And Tina is also certified in stormwater and erosion control ground and surface water Mm. sampling collection, monitoring, well installation, evacuation, and trenching. And this is all covered under OSHA. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us today. Very long introduction. Hi, ladies. How are you? Yeah, I apologize. Thank you so much, Tina, for joining us today. (laughs) And so it's my pleasure. Yeah. And so, Tina, can you share your story with our listeners about how you got involved in the environment, to, uh, environmental protection? And also, as we think about natural disasters, can you explain what is environmental due diligence to our listeners? Well, I, honestly, I think I got involved from the day I was born because I, my, uh, my heritage is agriculture. So my family is they farm. Uh, I believe that a farmer is a true steward of the land where we have to take care of the soil and the water because of the food, the crops, the, the uh, animals that we take care of. And I've always had a passion for the environment. I went to work for the county after I finished school where I fell under public works and somehow ended up with the landfill stuff and stormwater and underground tanks And my passion just grew and grew and grew. Um, Worked with a private consulting firm for four years. And then myself and another lady started Mallard in 1996. And, um, you know, it's been up and down because of the politics. But 
I still have a thirst for knowledge and enjoy sharing and, and helping people today. Wow. That's amazing. Really just amazing. We, we've purposely kept our prices low because there's a lot of people out there. You know, I, I started this company out of passion and to help people in my community, the farmers, the local businesses, the mom and pops. And honestly, those have been my most rewarding clients and still are till this day. Uh, it's, it's walking away, repairing a water well or fixing, uh, cleaning up a, a contaminated mom and pop service station like the old timey ones that you used to see years ago. Cleaning those properties up, the value that you get knowing that you have salvaged that and the water is drinkable is the most rewarding thing for me. Um, as we think about natural disasters, what is environmental due diligence? Environmental due diligence actually covers a lot. It can cover everything from our ecosystem, like for example, Hurricane Laura. Um, Louisiana is very well known with their, their ducks and alligators, their, their uh, wildlife. That has been affected because of, of uh, Hurricane Laura. Environmental due diligence is also such as the chemical plant that um, had a mishap and, and was on fire. It can be the rupture of a gas line, a natural gas line, a petroleum gas line. It can be a sewer line. Any of those things are environmental risk when you have a natural disaster. Um, People, I've seen for years, people that will walk in flood water mm -hmm. after all heavy rain and the hurricanes, tornadoes pass. There's automatically going to be stuff coming up out of the storm drains, a lot of it's sewage. When you get a, a hurricane like Laura, you've got sewer plants. They can't contain it. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to spill over. And you've got that raw sewage that's mixed in with the water, which contains bacteria because it's untreated. Unfortunately, and I hate to bring it up, but with COVID this year, the primary way that, that groundwater can become contaminated with COVID is in the sewage because of human waste. That's the way we dispose of it. With this drinking water, you know, with the water, that's the first thing that hit my mind with Laura. I wanted people to stay out of the water, not to drink the water because of the bacteria that's automatically in the environment. Right. And that can cause a lot of health risk, if not death, depending upon what it is. Um, with the Hurricane Laura, since it was so devastating to so many communities, what would you say are some of the top environmental risks when it comes to disasters um, like that type of hurricane and, and water consumption? Water consumption, I would not recommend drinking the water if it went back online right now because if there happened to be a, a water line rupture, you may have had uh, surface water that, that drained back into the water pipes. So you definitely want to flush all the lines to your home. I, I would say 15 minutes at every faucet. Another reason is because most homes, the water that's coming into the house runs through your hot water heater. Anytime that hot water, say, even if you're going on a trip for a week, you don't just want to go in and jump in the shower. You want to let that water run because that water has been sitting in that, that hot water heater, you know, stagnant, mm. forgive the word, for a certain number of days. So you want to run that through your pipes so that you have the clean water. If you have any traces of lead, which is, you know, very well known in, in older homes, older piping, um, if you flush that line, it reduces the concentration of the lead. I know after a storm or even they recommend boiling water, there's a yes and a no to that with me. Um, yes, you do need to boil the water, but if you have a constant, if you have lead contamination, even if it's not above 
EPA guideline. When you boil it, it doubles that concentration. And that's something, unfortunately, that the local governments and forgive me, but maybe even the federal government is not putting out there. Um, that's something that we need to make people more aware of. If you've had your water tested, even with one of the kits you can buy at, at uh, one of your hardware stores for lead, and you know that you've got even a minute concentration of lead, you know that you're taking a risk. Why, why would the government not tell us that? If you know that you've been doing this a really long time, is it because uh, they feel it's negligible or I just don't understand that? Um, I can't really speak for government. <laughs> I, uh, um, I think part of it is an oversight, to be honest with you, because I know some people that have worked in the environmental area of government for years, and, and they are still very passionate, caring people. You also have, I mean, I'm an older generation now when I, I mean, when you think about it, over 30 years in this, I've, I've watched a lot of people retire. Um, I think the younger generation doesn't understand. They're not as passionate to dig into it. They, they know what they've been taught. Where I honestly, besides the water testing that I do, I, I'm a home ins uh, an inspector for water wells. And that's one of the things that, that really jumped out at me. And I actually went back and looked through some past reports and stuff that I had, had generated. Um, and I thought, you know, anybody that's got a health concern, if you've got anything in your water, people don't realize it's, it can have an adverse effect. If, it's very important for small kids, uh, newborns, elderly people, anybody with health concerns that's maybe going through cancer treatments, mm. I highly recommend having your water tested. Because mm. if, if the water's treated with chemicals, if you've got high chloride, you know, something like that, you want to put a filter on it to reduce that. You want as pure and clean water as you can for your body. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I know there's a, a, you know, a number of environmental vulnerabilities that people face after hurricanes. And the terrible news with Hurricane Laura was there were more deaths that were caused by the improper use of portable generators than the storm itself. And an official uh, warned that the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning persists as thousands of households in Louisiana remain without power. So if you look at that, eight of the 15 hurricane-related deaths confirmed by the Louisiana Department of, of Health are attributed to carbon monoxide poisoning from portable generators, which can provide life-saving power in an emergency situation, but also poses a deadly threat if incorrectly used. So, Tina... I know we were talking about, uh, you know, the consumption of water, and I, I think I had mentioned before about a, a special device that I think every family should have, which is one of the um, life straws. Now, the life straw is a small water filter designed for one person that it can actually remove bacteria and pesticides from unclean water. Doesn't take out salt if you're, you know, by an ocean body of water, but it, it can actually help in these emergency types of situations. But other than that, as we look at, you know, how people can mitigate and make their life a little bit easier after a hurricane, how, you, you were saying that we could go and, and purchase a, a water testing kit. Is there some way they can send you a water sample or do you do that or? I, oh, I, I actually go out. Uh, I've got an EPA approved, actually it's two kits that I can go out and sample anything under the sun that I've invested in since I made some, you know, some changes to my company in 2017 to be able to go out to your home test your water uh, for I can collect the test for E. coli, but it takes 24 hours. I can let you know the, the, the rest of the results right then. What I do is I look at the results and I de design a filter or locate a filter that's best for an individual home. 
Wow. That and, is amazing. Yeah, but, you know, people can go, um, if you can go get the lead test at the hardware stores, right. you're not going to, I don't know, if it doesn't say EPA mm -hmm. approved on the back of the package, I cannot recommend it because EPA has to approve it. And one of the things when you're testing the water, you're looking for bacteria, nitrates, contaminants. I mean, is there just, there's so many unknowns for the typical person. What else are we looking for? Well, I also look at the pH concentration because your pH is, is like an acid level uh, that for someone like me is an indicator as to whether there's possible contamination or not. Where you've got something like Hurricane Laura, you've got all the petroleum plants around you, the convenience stores, you've got the chemical plants. Um, so it's going to take a pretty extensive test to test for every possible contaminant. The, the life straw that you're talking about, it will definitely help. Um, something else that is very generic, I keep on hand for me, uh, the charcoal that you can buy to go in a, in a fish tank filter yeah. and the coffee filters. Because if you take one of the, one of the filters, put it in like, like a coffee uh, that you would fix your coffee with, pour some of the charcoal in there, put another filter on top of it, pour water through it. Charcoal pulls out so many contaminants. And that's something that I've actually done staying in hotels before. Wow, that's really interesting, right? Ingrid, can you imagine? We have another tool in our toolbox to use. Right, and um, um, can you share with us some differences between the well water and city supplied water resources after a flood? When you've got water supplied resources, they automatically treat the water with various chemicals like chlorine, you've, you know, some places add fluoride. Um, with your private water wells, which of course I was brought up on and, and have, the, the water is more pure. My biggest concern personally with my well is I've got a little bit of iron concentration and calcium, which is natural minerals in the soil. So of course, you know, me being who I am, I test it, I've got filters on it. It's just pure clean water it doesn't have it hasn't been treated with any chemicals um the the concern getting back to the flooding with a private water well is if the underneath the well say the pad goes down flood water can go down beside the casing flood water can get into the casing if it's not properly built you need to pump out that well real well. I've went and reworked wells to just pump them out. It's called rehabilitation of a water well. Um, but you know, if, if that well area has become covered in flood water, you do not want to just turn on the faucet when the power comes back on and drink it. Same thing. You want to flush it. You want to have a bacteria test it at minimum run on it. You know, I, I travel a lot and so does Carrie. And wherever I go, I always drink the water. And I, I, oh, I can tell the water when you said the chlorine. And you're making faces, don't make faces. Oh. Well, I'm worried now. I'm thinking now, you know what would be good is if you had like, if we had a water travel test kit with us. So you're telling me you don't drink the that. water anymore. And um, I can tell mm -hmm. when there's chlorine or that, that yeah. taste uh, in it, right? Carrie, yeah, you've you traveled also, a lot, right? Oh, yes. I, at one point, I was putting right at 100,000 miles a year on a new truck. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'd done more road traveling because I pulled a 12-foot Vino's trailer that I customized inside for a portable office and on job sites. And, uh, yeah, staying in a hotel, I... Yeah, yeah I so do. I'm not going to drink the water anymore. No, don't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> I never because, you know, depending upon where you're at, it's and, and I'm sure that you've noticed this, there's some areas... In the United that, States. In the United States. It's not like when I travel outside the United States. It's just... It, well, yeah, States. you don't want to drink the water. I don't want to drink the water even in the United States? 
you know, as, as dirty as I get on jobs, when you take a shower in some of these places and you still feel like you've got a film on you, <laughs> that really bothers me. Mm. Well, but wow. I can I can hook you ladies up. Actually, it would be a good experiment um, with the uh, little test kits that you can throw in your bags. You know, if you want to kind of keep track of it and where you're at, and us get together later on and compare some notes. Um, I, I can even send you some charcoal and filter things. And you know, these are just things that I've learned over the years that. A lot of companies, they want to charge big money for putting this inline filter on your house. If I got, matter of fact, I've got to go to a lady tomorrow that inherited her family's home that built a garage around the water well. Huh, that doesn't sound good. Well, it, it's okay, I think. Um, but she's having some a little bit of problem with the well, but it's because it's so old. And... I was giving her, she was talking about in her toilet, the ring around it, and I told her about the Clorox tabs and, you know, the different toilet bowl tablets. But, uh, you know, I walked in, tested the water, and said, I can either order this for you or this is one you can actually buy at a local hardware store if you have a problem installing it and walked out the door. You know, because I, I was brought up with very strong values treat people like you would want to be treated and I still carry that through till today mm. you know if um, if even with with you ladies keeping you safer uh, brushing your teeth you know the experiment of it I'm happy to fix it up fix up the kids uh, we appreciate that we will definitely get together and and do that I, I find that um, as long as I understand the water safety in the area that I'm living, for instance, up in Massachusetts, we have one of the uh, towns that has very good safe water. And yet when I'm down here in North Carolina, I will not drink our water here. I always have bottles. And of course, during all of our travels overseas, there was so many different uh, elements in the water that we would never even brush our teeth with any water and avoid exactly. mouth during showers. So my, one of my questions to you is this. It's interesting when we talk about bottled water because that's what we drink whenever we go to hotels because I won't drink the water in, in hotels, but where does the bottled water come from? So sometimes people say you're only as good as the company that's actually uh, making the water. That's and correct. From the same source that you're getting out of your tap, well, uh, no. that's not going to be. Some are, honestly, there's, it's been proven that some are and some aren't. Uh, if you, I always look on the back of the bottle for spring water. You know, I'm very proud of living in Florida. We've got natural springs that uh, we, in my opinion, our springs produce the best water in the United States. It's the most pure. It's actually got some minerals in it that you can't find in other springs throughout the United States. Um, but there are some companies that has taken tap water and it goes through a process that they're selling this bottled water. And I feel that that is manipulation of the public and it should not be allowed. I agree. And one of the uh, safety tips that Ingrid and I have talked about before on our Teach, Reach and Empower program was one of the scams that was happening um, worldwide where people would sell bottle of, bottles of water in uh, different uh, tourist sites. And what the kids were doing was taking old bottles and literally filling it up with their tap water and selling it to um, unsuspecting tourists. So you always, ha always had to make sure that when you opened the bottle, it made the sound that it was completely sealed. But um, now I like, I have another question for you about beach water after a hurricane. Oh. So I always like to check the environmental quality websites to find out about beach water and the environmental protection agency does a, a really good job in North Carolina I think over our past year they had over 6,000 water samples on the coast last year and I think there was 46 swimming advisories which usually lasted about a day but I think that's really important that after mm -hmm. a storm comes in or a hurricane that we really stay out of the ocean for a while. Do you agree with that or? I completely agree, but I'll go a step further. You don't just need to stay out of the oceans. You also need to stay out of the creeks, the uh, the streams, the lakes, 
uh, you need to treat even your swimming pool water. You don't want to just go dive in the swimming pool afterwards. Uh, even though most of the swimming pools are chlorine or salt water treated, you still want to test it and make sure that, it, that it's the right uh, pH and everything that it's supposed to be. Another, it's funny you brought that up about the beach because um, Florida had a situation last year where we had a bacteria ins ins inspection uh, that people were getting at the beach. I personally don't think is, you know, if you look at Florida, we've got beach all the way around. I personally don't think enough samples are done. Um, over in Louisiana, Mississippi, God bless those people. But I do think it's very important because you've also got some offshore drilling out there. Anytime that you have bacteria that some areas of the United States have underwater piping that they're actually, their sewage treatment plants cannot handle the sewage treatment they are exiting it through pipes that a lot of people don't realize into our oceans in the Gulf. And what happens, that water comes back into shore. So you're going to have higher bacteria concentration levels at times than you do other times. People don't need to swim in that. I, I want to share a story because, you know, we have a lot of lakes up here in Massachusetts. And because of the COVID, uh, many of the towns left their beaches and their little lakes open to swim, but they closed the restrooms. So everyone was at the beach and the little lake and what was happening? You know, the kids were peeing and the probably adults were going in the lake right. and it was just awful. I don't know how long it took the cities and towns to actually perform the inspection of the water um, I don't know what the regulation is on that, but when they finally did perform the test, they said the bacteria count was really high and they closed the the beach. Yeah, I can see that. Um, Do you think COVID could be transmitted through that? COVID. Yeah, there's so much about COVID that we don't know. When COVID first hit, I uh, I don't think Carrie, I'm sure she doesn't remember it. I lost, and this is just, don't take it literally. I, I lost my mind because the first thing that came to my mind with all of my experience was the sampling, the unknowns that you have potentially into the water into the waste and and it's taken them a while because of me being a small company very proud of purposely staying a small company um you know i can't get the attention to say hey you need to be testing for this you need to be warning about that everything's come true i said that if it would eventually show up in water because of the human waste um Another thing that bothered me is when they were talking about the cruise lines that was coming in, you never see a cruise line uh, hook up a sewage line like you do an RV trailer to, to, to pump out the sewage village. Think about that. So where is the sewage from these, these uh, ocean liners going? It's, if they're not getting rid of it whenever they dock, Mm. You know, they're getting rid of it in the water. That's going to come into shore eventually. Where you've got the, the cruise lines docking, it would have been scary for me to have went out and tested the water in that area. And even in the ports and stuff. Right, because there was a time where there were a lot of cruise ships stuck off the shore, not allowed That's to. Right. And it was weeks and weeks and weeks. That's right. Very good point, and that must have been absolutely frightening for you. It's almost the ones that know more. Actually, it must be terrifying. Well, you know, I I came out publicly with the fact that I was very upset that all of our first responders, not just in Florida, throughout the United States, did not have safety glasses, gloves, uh, and a mask as a part of their daily gear bag. 
because any time that you pull up to an accident, you've got airborne possible airborne pathogens. You don't know what disease that individual has that was in that accident. You don't want to reach in and breathe the same air. You don't want to touch that person. And to find out that our first responders didn't have that just really infuriated me and it, it put a lot of fear for me for our first responders and their families. When it comes to the to the waste, I don't honestly I've I don't think enough study has been done on the groundwater, I mean on water since COVID started. Right. And that's going to be very unfortunate. Right. Well, it's interesting that uh, we bring up that we have now found COVID in our water sources. Now, what has happened in the past with, let's say, our outbreaks with, um, um, with the flu? Do we test the water and see that flu is in our water source or any other diseases that? Actually, uh, the water, your treated water uh, from communities and municipalities, it's automatically treated for viruses and bacteria. Um, so that is not as much of a concern. I hope that, they, that they're sampling for it, but the COVID is a, is a little bit different animal to your typical cold and flu, you know, seasonal cold and flu. There's so much unknowns about it that I don't understand why there hasn't been a call to do more sampling. And I think that there should be. I will be interested to see if they're sampling the, the water over in Louisiana. I know someone said that their air monitors uh, were apparently not working to be able to, to monitor the air. Mm. And I, you know, I'm thinking, well, I've got a portable air monitor, you know. I, you know, forgive me, I don't always agree with the tactics of, of our government in keeping people safe after a disaster. I, you know, private consultants have a lot of these tools readily available, and the state, state agencies should also have. And I think that they get overwhelmed. It's kind of like uh, the care facilities. I'll, if you live in a coastal state, you've been hit by a disaster. Why do you not have a backup generator? Why do you not have a portable water tank on that site that you can fill up and keep water for those patients that cannot be moved? And, and isn't that interesting? Because preparedness planning is that. We already know natural disasters hit us every single year. We know hurricanes are coming. We know there's going to be blackouts. We know that we're going to need uh, fresh water. We know California is going to have fires. And uh, fires and earthquakes, right? So we already know. But it's amazing how, um, how preparation and preparedness planning isn't front and center. <laughs> It's, it's really amazing. That's why Ingrid and I love doing our podcasts and, and getting this inf information in front of people. Just to share a little bit more about awareness and how we can do better for ourselves and for our family. Oh, I, I mean, part of my job um, is writing health and safety plans. I, you know, I've got a generator. I used to have a generator for my parents' house, uh, especially as they got up in age. We actually put a window unit just a portable window unit and one of the windows that could be plugged into the generator to circulate, which is very important for, for small children, anyone with any type of respiratory issue, or elderly people. You know, they, that's, that's concerning me right now in Louisiana with the fact that the power is going to be out for so long. And I understand, I went through Hurricane Michael. I was without power personally for eight days. I did not suffer like other people do, uh, but it's because of the job I'm in, you know, and, and uh, I've got the five gallon water containers that you can buy that I fill up with water. Um, I save my, my juice jugs. You know, you can't have too much water. If you don't mm. need it after everything gets restored, hey, guess what? Save it and water your plants with it. You know, it, it can still be used. And uh, water is one of the key things to prepare for, for a storm. Mm -hmm. 
which the the way these storms are getting I don't recommend anybody staying that doesn't have to you know I've always wrote them out um you know Michael that was that was a different bear um I honestly will tell anybody I was never ever afraid of bad weather when it started the thunder and lightning and like when Laura was coming in I made the prediction that Laura would be as bad as Michael and I watched it in my heart and even though it didn't hit my area my heart went out I could not check on the people I know enough I found a friend that her because of her mother's condition she couldn't leave and I walked her through on preparing because you know what I understand that it um I recommend people leave but there are situations just like the nurses that stayed at that hospital with those ki those little infants there's situations that people can't leave but there's still things that facilities and people can have in place it it doesn't take a lot of money right. you know to keep yourself safe old t-shirts don't throw them away cut them into rags and put them in a ziploc bag to be able to to keep with the water that you that you catch up before the storm to wipe off your face to wipe the back of your neck you know it's little th cooling tips like that that helps tremendously in 106 degree heat um what are some ways to make the water safer if you have no power or electricity like you know how, how long do you have to boil the water for it needs to come to a very full bowl dependent upon you know whether you're using an outside oven a gas oven or stove electric stove it, you definitely need to I would say personally five minutes you know a full rolling bowl wow. but do not drink that water until it completely cools down because if there are any well, if there are any uh possible contaminants in it like heavy iron lead let it get cold basically before you drink it because hopefully that will reduce some of that back out wow that's amazing so one of the one of the things that i keep a lot of is just rubbing alcohol uh it's good for bug bites but it's also good uh, to mix with water to make your own hand sanitizer Great. and uh, yeah and and uh, I keep a lot of that on hand you know I ha you've, mm. you've got the decontamination tablets that you can buy to, to put in water uh, that works real well so quick question what was the most shocking thing that you have uncovered in your work Well, it could have been the garbage truck buried that was still full of garbage. It could have been part of a person's skull. It could have been a huge green rock that I was told to cover back up because nobody knew what it was. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Those are some interesting stories. We'll have to have you back on another podcast. We can oh, well, you know, I've done expert witness and I'm, I'm very humbled to work with, with this particular attorney, but there for a few years, she would call me and I would, and send me to this or that. And, you know, I had uh, everything from a, a goat jump on the hood of my car one time. To, I've been shot at twice. It's been an adventure, but I would, I've loved every minute of it, um, you know. Now, here's a question about um, uh, Flint, Michigan. Could, do, you, do you think this could happen in another city around our country? Absolutely. And so how can, how can families mm. advocate, advocate for themselves so that this doesn't happen? That was just absolutely horrendous. You know, we've actually got places throughout the United States that I don't know if the residents, I, 
we should be able to, ch to, to trust our government. We should be able to trust our municipalities. Um, yeah, the I main thing I would say is, is have your own water tested. Yeah. You know, ha have it tested with inside your house, have it tested from the line that enters your house before it enters. The, you know, because a lot of municipalities will say, oh, well, you know, it's just the piping of your home. Sometimes that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, we had a situation here in the Panhandle that, that the water company settled out of court uh, where the pipes that they were still using was some of the original piping ever put in. All the contaminants out of those pipes were going into people's homes. We had a small child die of lead poisoning. Mm. Very sad. Mm. Just another story of environmental injustice and bad decision making, really, in that crisis in, in Flint, Michigan. Just devastating for the families around the country that aren't having fresh water. No. Oh, that, it, it, that absolutely, you know, we cannot live without clean water. Nothing lives without clean water. The foods that are grown uh, and the crops for food source has got to have pure clean water because what people don't realize is even with a garden if you're if that water's contaminated sooner or later the 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 fruits of those plants are going to soak in a certain amount of that contamination and pass on to people now here's something that um uh, and I'm a strong advocate because I am very proud of my farm heritage and, and have a farm. Uh, where you see the food recalls for E. coli and stuff like that. Sure, you know, people don't realize that a lot of the commercial growers will actually allow wastewater treatment facilities to take out what they call the dried sludge. Uh, the, you know, the treated product that goes through the sewer treatment plant. And, and they'll use it for fertilizer where they're growing the commercial vegetables. And it's like, no, no, did y'all test that? Well, of course the answer is always no. Yeah, you'll be recalled. Sure enough, you know, that's where a lot of the E. coli is coming from. So that goes to our state agencies and our ag state agencies for allowing these commercial growers to do that. Now, wait one minute, because I don't think I understood what you just said. What? What are the growers using? They w when a wastewater treatment facility treats the sewage, it, it you have um, it's almost like a sand left out, a leftover after it's supposedly been treated. Okay, they have to spread that somewhere. A lot of the farmers, commercial farmers, will allow them to take this out to where they're growing these vegetables, mix it in, till it in with the soil and then plant the plants. Hmm. And some of it still has E. coli in it. So if you, you notice when vegetables are recalled, 90% of the time it's for E. coli. Right. Hmm. Interesting. So what's really important is that these farmers are testing that, that soil before it's mixed in with everything. They're supposed to be testing the soil and the water. And that's, that's where the uh, Food Ad Inspection Administration has fell lax. I don't know if it's because of the staffing or, or what have you, but here's what people don't realize. If I own a commercial farm, I provide, say, all these tomatoes and send to this particular supermarket. <clears throat> If you buy those tomatoes and get sick, I'm liable. Consumers could sue the producer because I'm liable in what I produce and sell to you for it to be nutritious, not have any contaminants in it. Right. And that is going to become a bigger issue because with the weather, um, you know, this year I had a heck of a time growing a garden. And, and I, you know, I grew up 
I'm, all my life, I've always had a garden. I had the most difficult time this year, and it was because of the weather. It was either too much rain or it turned off too hot. And I've talked to a lot of other people that normally have huge gardens every year. The weather plays a big role in it. And, you know, your foods are going to start going up in your supermarkets because of it. The foods that, that commercial growers supply, they need, they have an obligation to make sure that that water is clean and the soil is clean that it's growing in. That's amazing. Sorry. No, that's just really great information for us all to have because we need to do uh, risk mitigation in so many different areas of our life, including our soil and with our water and how we live and the, the food that we consume. We want to make sure it's coming from safe, safe resources. Right? Now you're going to look at the, at, at the vegetables when you go to the grocery store, aren't you? Well, no, no. I <laughs> Anyways, I, yeah, I always think about, you know, what were the areas where this was grown, what type of water was used, and, and pesticides, I'm, herbicides. Yeah, I'm a little, I, I'm, I'm leery about uh, the product, so I want to make sure that it's coming from healthy areas, and I grew up in California, and I used to have a huge garden out there. I've always gardened growing up, and so, you know, it's, when you eat from your own garden, mm -hmm and you know your soil, and you know the water you're putting in it, you, I think you appreciate what you're purchasing at stores, you know, once you go through that process, right? Well, I know that I enjoy a tomato tasting like a tomato, and I normally don't find that in your, your commercial supermarkets. Um, I'm actually, uh, because of inheriting the farm, I will actually be uh, doing extended growing season this year with what they call a high tunnel to hopefully be able to help help out some of the the people in the area with you know it's basically your garden type vegetables it's not necessarily your peas and corn and stuff like that um, you know one of the things that my dad always done there's always elderly people or people on hard times that we would always help out and uh I'm hoping to do that and hopefully uh, recover what I missed this year. I, I was gone for two days and came back and my tomato plants was dead and I was very disappointed in that. Oh, no. so, yeah, I, you know, being a country girl, I always look forward to tomatoes every year. Right, nothing better. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's something, there's, people can grow food even if they live in an apartment. Uh, there's certain things that you can grow, the herbs and spices. There's a lot of things that, that can be done that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. That is so true, so true. So, Ingrid, do you have a few more questions? Um, what strategies would you share with us um, and, you know, best thing for our listeners to get prepared for the next disaster? One thing that that was brought up um, in Hurricane Laura that I thought was an excellent idea is to make sure that you have your name, social security number, information written down and your next to pen and put it into a Ziploc bag. I know that, that the person made that comment because of people that didn't want to evacuate, but that's actually good for anybody any anytime. You need to have a next of kin, an emergency contact on you, you know, behind your driver's license or your ID at all times. Anytime that a disaster is coming, you want to put that stuff into a Ziploc bag uh, because you don't want it ruined. Um, I've got my insurance papers and Porter Company papers and everything in a sealed container, but in case that container comes open, all of that is in, a, in Ziploc bags and then some of it is in doubled Ziploc bags to help keep it safe mm -hmm. because there's certain paperwork you will need after that storm. I also recommend uh, the containers to catch up water for around the home, uh, to, to flush the toilet, to, to wipe off your face. Not saying you necessarily want to drink it, um, especially if it's treated water, you know, People have different opinions about it, 
but to wipe off your face, to, to uh, try to keep good hygiene during the storm while the power's out. And, and one of the best ways is to, to keep alcohol on hand, mix it with a little bit of water, uh, and then just use rags, you know, or paper towels. Since paper towels and, and toilet tissue and stuff like that is hard to come by with COVID, you want to keep a supply of that. Put it in Ziploc bags so it doesn't get wet. Yeah, that's because the last, you know, people are already doing without. Um, you want to make sure that you have your medications and uh, in, in your necessities that you can slip into to a waterproof like Ziploc bags or a syllable bags because you definitely don't want to go without your medication. If you've got pets, if you've got infants, make sure you've got formula, diapers, wipes. Have that on hand. Always, always have it on hand. But during hurricane season, I know in the Midwest they have Tornado Alley and stuff. Even like uh, in, in California, this even goes for people up north that have to battle the snow and possibly outage during blizzards and stuff. You know, it, this is a yearly event. This is not a one-time event. Have it on hand. You know, once the disaster passes, fold the bag it was in, put it in a safe place. But when that comes up, you always want to have extra. That's right. So that's what we call our jump bag, right? We call jump my bag. jump bag. Yeah, my jump bag. Which one of my jump bags? <laughs> because, you know, I've got two labs, which now are senior labs. So, of course, I've got a little duffel bag for their milk bones and their their food and their water containers. And they've never drank in treated water. Um, you know, so yeah. I've well, got them. And now that they're seniors. Now... Now, I would like our listeners to know exactly where they can find out more information about you and your services and what you offer. So where can our listeners find you? They can go online to uh, mallard-inc.com. I'm also on Twitter. Um, I've got an Instagram account. But uh, if they'll go on there, they can reach out to me at any time. If you're on Twitter or Instagram, you can send me a DM. And, you know, it doesn't matter where in the United States that someone is. I am always happy to take time to answer a question, uh, to try to help point people in the right direction about tips and everything. It, it, the only stupid question is one that someone doesn't ask. I love that. I love that. Well, Tina, we want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us. And we're so grateful for the in-depth knowledge that you shared with us today. And to our listeners for week one of National Preparedness Month, we want you to make a communication plan. We want to make sure that you talk to your friends and family about how you'll communicate before, during, and after a disaster. And we will be back for another episode to increase in public awareness and to reduce the dangers faced by citizens in their daily life, whether traveling around the world or around the corner. Right, Ingrid? That's right. So Thanks, please, ladies, for having me. Yeah, so please don't forget to click and follow that button and subscribe, and we will see you next time on the Savvy Safety Sisters. 